So the next talk is a properly brave one. It mentions Valent, and it's going to be given by a man uh, who needs no introduction because you've been uh, watching his mug for the whole day long in this <laughs> afternoon session as the session chair. So go on, David. Thank you. As you've been said, my name is David Edmondson. I've been at KDE there for over 15 years, Plasma there for six, seven, six or seven of them, and I've been a Wayland there for what seems like forever. So, about this talk, what do I want to do to make it different from all the other talks? When we talk about Wayland, there's always a lot of focus on the window manager or your shells because that's where a lot of the development work needs to happen. But we tend to neglect the applications, which still have quite a lot to do. So for the duration of this talk, we're not going to make any mention of Plasma. We're not going to make any mention of Quinn. There'll be no more mention of any other desktops. I won't mutter the name of any other compositor. Those were good jokes. Don't try to sway me otherwise. Um, and we're going to focus purely on applications and Wayland, of course. So as an application developer, why do you need to care about Wayland? Well, it's one of the biggest transitions we faced as a Linux desktop. It's a lot of changes in a very, very core fundamental area that all of the applications are sharing. So I've got two sets of slides for this, an encouraging one and a more carrot and stick approach. So Wayland does have a load of really cool features that you can use as an application developer. You get far more detailed input events in lots of different nuances that makes the input so much better than what we had on X11, even with X02. We have considerably faster rendering. There's a lot less happening to get from you making a change in your application to it arriving on the screen. You get faster frame rates. You can get reduced power consumption. Firefox is doing some incredibly exciting things in the upcoming releases where when a user scrolls, all it does is redraw a scroll bar and then send some magic metadata to your compositor to do other, all the other work. It can do some very clever things. All around, it's going to be amazing. But if you're a calculator app, if you're writing KCalc, realistically, I'm not going to lie, none of this is going to matter. It's not going to be anything in Wayland that makes your application much better. If it's a boring app, no offense to KCalc, if it's a boring app, it's a boring app. It doesn't really gain a lot. But there is another side to your Wayland side. The more negative way of encouraging people to care about Wayland. You don't have a choice. Or certainly you won't have a choice. Right now, uh, we're not on Wayland by default. And for those that are, they're still at backwards compatibility level of X Wayland, where X clients can still run. But there's a few things to know. X Wayland, when it's, which is where a Wayland compositor still supports backwards compatibility, it's not an exact one-to-one -one match, partly deliberately for security reasons. You still can't just sniff data from our applications. It's not quite the same as being an X application on X. And there's other nuances such as scaling where things behave slightly differently. We're also finding that there's several places where People are switching to Wayland by default. Even if we're not in Plasma, GNOME has switched in a lot of places. There are people running Wayland compositors which don't have any X Wayland support. And as people try and phase out X from their systems, at some point, we are going to see desktops where X Wayland isn't an option. So at some point, you're going to have to care. And this is a genuine code snippet from a KDE application. I won't say what. I'm not sure if you can read it, but the code says, if a platform is Wayland, show a message box and quit. And I can understand why I've done that, is to try and encourage people to use XWayland where right now our performance is, is better. It, get a, it, it might get a better user experience, particularly as this happens to crash anyway on Wayland. So I can see why you want to encourage users. That makes sense. But this code snippet is also blocking any developer from even trying. And at some point, you're going to find yourselves five years down the line, suddenly forced into running on Wayland. And then you'll be surprised when your functionality is missing. And then users are going to be forced into a bad situation. It's important 
that we start early and all your developers should be doing things on Wayland and at least reporting and elevating any issues they have and making a big fuss if something is missing. So when it comes to this code, I'm not angry, but I am disappointed. So what's the current state of a Qt application if you run it on Wayland? Because in theory, Qt abstracts everything. So it should just work just like Kate on Windows, right? Well, the difference between theory and practice is in theory, they're both the same thing. In practice, there are some nuances. And that Kate example is quite good. In theory, it should work, but if you look through the Kit repo, you can see it's Christoph Coleman making a bunch of changes which are Windows specific because things were found, even though the KD libraries and the Qt framework should have abstracted it. It's also interesting to note it's the Kate developers making those changes. Steve Baum is not making those changes. Microsoft's not doing the work. He's sitting about in a massive mansion. And that's true for your Wayland port. It's very similar to porting to Windows. It's a whole new platform. And you can't expect all your Wayland developers to do your work. I'll be lounging about in a massive mansion. So let's say you try your app on Wayland and there's a bug. Who's at fault? There's actually a couple of different answers because there's lots of components in play. There are deliberate beha Wayland behavioral differences where we're not trying to make things behave exactly as they are on X and it will require applications to adjust. There are also potentially you've got bugs in your application. Just because something happened to work on X11 and we should be abstracting it, we might be surfacing some bugs that already exist. We also have a completely new plugin part that we're going through in Qt. It's a very different code path. So we might find we're hitting some bugs in Qt Wayland. And Qt Wayland is a lot of code, and it may have um, bugs in it. It could be bugs in the compositor. And generally, this is the first place to get blame. But for most things that are happening inside a typical standard Qt application, it's not where a bug is going to be. It might be but it shouldn't be your only point of complaint. You might also find we're missing specifications. Wayland is behaviorally different from, from X11. Some things behave differently. And often something that could have been done in X through a hack, we're trying to do in neat, very semantic ways in Wayland. But because of that, we need to come up with a new semantic way for each of these individual use cases. So you may find a specifications missing. And then we have to go all the way up to upstream because it's important that we get things standardized so that even though we even when we fix our application, it doesn't just work on KDE, but it also works on these other desktops. So let's go over some of the deliberate Wayland behavioral differences. And I'm sure you may have heard all of these already. You cannot make a libx11 call as a Wayland client. This probably goes without saying. But it does happen. We see code paths where we hit it. It's one of the easiest things to search for. If you're doing something with QX with X11 or QX11 extra display or connection, it's obviously going to, to fail. In general, most cases where we hit that, we have found that an abstraction layer has already been written in frameworks. I'm not going to say that's true for everything you could possibly do. But in generally, general, we, we're trying in KDE to introduce these abstraction layers. And obviously, Qt is an abstraction layer. Another big behavioral difference is, is you can't eavesdrop events. Wayland clients only get input when they have focus. So if you don't have focus and you want to find out when a user clicks a mouse or presses Shift X Q, you can't. You don't have those events. And this is important to mention, this also happens if you're running inside X Wayland. So, if you're doing your own by hand idle detection and your own by hand global shortcuts, it's not going to work by design. But if you use abstraction layers, K idle time and K global Excel, it'll just work out the box. It'll just continue to work exactly as before, which is amazing. You can't grab other window content. And this is deliberate. If you call Q window grab window, it'll just return an empty image. 
The best thing to do is replace it with a debus request to XDD desktop portal. And this is true if you want to find out the color of an individual pixel for like one of those color drop icons. One thing we're seeing with Wayland is not everything that was done in X11 has a direct equivalent in Wayland. There is a direct equivalent, but it's not necessarily just because it was an X11, which happened to be the display communication. We don't have to do it in a display communication when you're porting to Wayland. Sometimes we're doing things using other technology and other things out of bounds. And if you want video content, I forgot to mention this, if you want video content, you want to use Pipewire. And it's code and plasma doing that already. One of the bigger changes that probably is more likely to affect you for a common app, global positioning. Wayland windows don't know where they are, and they can't set where they are using a main shell that we have. And this is probably one of the biggest porting challenges. But there are a couple of options that are available and supported. The most important one is a framework called XCG Positioner, which is where we semantically state where a pop-up should be relative to your parent window. So you would have this if you have a window and you want to open a context menu or a little tooltip or a combo box where you get a drop-down list of options. All of those are new windows. And we're saying where that window pop-up should open relative to your window that we already have. Now, one challenge with that, one behavioral difference, is if you open something with, without global positions, the client can't do detection of whether we're going to hit a screen edge or not. So if you have a combo box with a really long list and your window is quite near bottom of the screen and its combo box is near bottom of the screen, you don't want it just to overflow off the screen because that's rubbish. And on X11, you would typically do some of that code yourself, or sometimes the window manager would just shove it on top of the, on top of your combo box. It would, it would just shove it randomly. But with XCG Positioner, which is really quite clever, you can provide hints on how to handle a constrained situation. So in this example of this combo box that doesn't fit beneath, you can say, well, I want the contents to be above where my combo box is and not just occlude it. Or you could even say, I want everything to be shifted to your right to avoiding a combo box this way, or to resize the window. And you can tell it how you would like it to be handled, and then the compositor does the right thing. So it's a very, very well-designed class, but the Qt implementation is kind of weak. You're using this framework implicitly whenever you create a Q menu, Q context box, or Q combo box, or a little tooltip. But what Qt is doing internally to match the existing internal API is just mapping everything to a global coordinate and then mapping everything back into a relative position. And then we're not exposing all of these clever APIs that exist in the framework. One of the other protocols that exists is Plasma Shell, which is what we're using for all of the panels and some other custom parts within Plasma. And here is a sneaky sort of add-on API that we've added specifically for panels and things where you can set an exact position in global coordinates. And if you look at the code for plasma panels, you'll see this. And the downside of this is it's not universally supported. In fact, we've been trying to restrict it access within KDE applications. The implementation was done quite early on in our way in development. And in hindsight, it's quite poor, particularly with other changes, and overall we're trying to phase it out. But you might see this class listed. And last but not least, one of the new things that are popping up in the scene, layer shell, which is where we semantically position something on a screen. So if you're familiar with QML anchors, this is basically the same, but for whole windows. We can say, I want my window to be anchored to your right, and I want to be anchored to your left and the top and 200 pixels tall, and it'll be at the top 200 pixels tall and you've got margins and such, exactly like QML anchors. And we've used this already inside case splash, and we've made an entire library available where we expose every feature that's relevant inside layer show, all of these margins and different offsets. And this is a somewhat standardized protocol. It works outside KDE. One big con with the current implementation that will be fixed out, it's just a technical hitch temporarily, is you can't have layer shell and regular windows in the same application. Once you've committed to using that layer shell library, you then have to use that layer shell library 
for every other window, which means every other window needs to be semantically positioned to a screen, which doesn't make sense for some situations. So what are some of the other differences we see in Wayland? It's quite strict in terms of protocol on what it can do. The one thing, just to enforce that your, app, your application is doing things correctly. So pop-ups are uh, one example. So for every time you have a pop-up, you must have a parent. And if you have a pop-up that creates a pop-up, you must do this in the right order. You must create a pop-up that depends on a pop-up after your first pop-up, which seems natural. But it's also important from a Wayland protocol perspective to destroy things in the correct order. You can't open a pop-up and then a pop-up from it and then close the original. Doing so is Wayland considers illegal. It's akin to murder. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Don't murder, don't create or destroy your pop-ups in the wrong order. And cute Wayland tries to hide these problems, but it's having to sort of retroactively guess what your client should be doing. So anything that is moderately sane is supported inside the Wayland protocol. It's, but if you've got something very quirky inside your code, it can just cause everything to just be quit, uh, closed or your pop-ups to be closed in the wrong place. So here's what, an example of what I mean with multiple pop-ups. In this case, it's important that we close this rightmost pop-up first and then the middle one and then the left one. If you do anything wrong, Initially, your application will be terminated, but Qt Wayland tries to hide, solve that. But if it tries to solve it, you'll just get a situation which just doesn't work, which is slightly better than crashing, but not by much. Window activation. So what do I mean by window activation? That's where we're passing focus from one window to another. So I'm in my chat application. I click on a link and open a browser. I expect a browser to suddenly appear in the foreground, even if the foreground the browser is already open with some other content inside. Or you're in Dolphin, you've got your spreadsheet, uh, you've got your list of files, you click on a PDF of this presentation, you expect your PDF viewer to come to your front, even if your PDF viewer is active. Or the storm from the system tray, where you click on the status notifiers and for Telegram, you want Telegram to appear. Makes sense. So, I'm going to do a quick reminder of how this should be done on X11 and what you should be doing right now. So you should be creating this magical string, um, either getting your user time or using case data info. And then we pass this out of bounds um, over the Dbus message that we're sending anyway, or over an environment variable if we're creating a new process. And then the receiving client should import this and then use QX11 extras um, set user input time, use case startup, startup info uh, to import this magical token, which does everything internally, and only then do we call request activate. So that's what you should be doing now. What everybody probably does is ignore all of this and just call force active window. And it's something that if you heard Martin uh, complaining about focus issues on Quinn, you would be told not to do this. API documentation says not to do this. Pragmatically, lots of people do because it worked and it was simpler. So now let's talk about what you should be doing on Wayland. Well, you should be creating a magic token. You should pass it, be passing out using any other methods, Dbus environment variables, and then importing that into a new client. So the concept is exactly the same as what you should be doing. But we don't have a force active window lazy workaround. The API is subtly different, and I would go as far as to say it's considerably easier because case startup info is very, 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 very confusing. So new classes are K window system request deactivation token, and then you get a signal back once it's because it's an asynchronous operation. And then from a client, you import it and you call set current XG activation token on a window and a window goes into foreground. And where possible, we are trying to handle this uh, implicitly into existing calls, uh, like case startup info on X X11 when you launch an application. But when you're importing a client, when you've been activated, we tend to be in a client custom code, so a client does need to adapt.
Okay, so minimizing to a system tray. If you use QSystem tray or case status notify item, everything will continue to work as is, uh, particularly on pl Plasma for QSystem tray. Uh, one behavioral difference that I'm seeing quite a lot, particularly on random cute GitHub projects, is you don't have API to know when a window is minimized. So if you've got this fake concept of you click close and it minimizes to your tray, it simply isn't going to work. Okay, so that's some very deliberate changes you need to be aware of. But I'm going to talk about some bugs in your app that Wayland might be surfacing. There's one common one that I've seen nine times that I'm going to go into detail of. Right, so if everyone remembers Qt2, Qt3, very early days of X11, every widget, widget used to be its own independent window. So a, a button was a window, a label was a window at a very technical level. And then all of these windows formed together to create a top level window as you would know it. Right? And in Qt4, I don't know exactly when, at Qt4, we stopped doing that. Now we just have a window that has all of the window content. But this code path was kept. You could still turn a widget into a window because it does make sense deliberately in a few very, very specialist cases. So if you're a media player, putting a media content in its own separate window, uh, OBS does this, um, it makes sense. You can get some performance boost out of it in some specific cases. And Wayland has an analogous situation to this X11 window embedding for these same specific cases. There's a concept of Wayland subsurfaces that Q to abstracts. So in theory, this should all work exactly the same. There's no need to be aware of it. And that is true for any correct code. But one problem we've been seeing a lot is it's very, very, very easy to accidentally turn a Q widget into a window when you're not trying to do it, when you're not doing it for performance reasons. And if you turn something into a window and then never show that window, never call Q window show on that wid widget, you end up in a situation where you've created a window but then rendered the content somewhere else. And doing so accidentally causes no visible issues on uh, QXB, on X11. It's still buggy, it's still wrong, it's still very, very weird, but you can't see those. And I can't expect developers to fix bugs that you can't see. But when you're running against Qt Wayland, very, very bizarre things happen because it just can't map things quite correctly. So you get situations where your input just doesn't reach certain widgets. So it has a slightly odd effects that you need to be wary of. So if you have a win, if you do encounter this bug, where your symptoms are, things are just behaving weird in a subtree of widgets, check for this. And it's quite easy to check for, just put a breakpoint in the queue platform window constructor. You should only have a queue platform window constructor when you're actually creating a window. Um, similarly, the same bug, but coming up in a different way. Avoid QGL widget. It's a class that you don't want to be using. It's rubbish. Q OpenGL widget should be used instead. This is what your documentation inside Qt says. Follow your documentation. But we have seen people where people haven't made it. We have seen cases where people haven't made a port yet. Another related case, if you are deliberately turning some widgets into a window or deliberately using subsurfaces, be sure to enable this flag, which I've cleverly cut off, called don't create native widget siblings. And without going into what this flag does, is it breaks your application and you don't want it. It's there purely for some compatibility with if you want this very same behavior as what we had in Q2 and Q3, which you don't. And there have been some other uh, situations. I fix a crash in Keo where it just expected input to come in a certain order after we um, create an, uh, a modal dialogue. It was sure that once you created a modal dialogue, any input must be in that modal dialogue. Anything else would be something to assert over. And that wasn't true on Wayland because of a slight asynchronous gap. And there are many, many cases where things happen to work fine on X11, but it doesn't mean your app was right. It, not seeing a bug doesn't mean a bug wasn't there. 
And the takeaway from this is you just need to test. So let's dive a bit into Cute Wayland itself. Cute Wayland somewhat has an impossible job because in Wayland, people are trying to revisit some how can we do window management and all of the display server works in some new and creative ways. And those ways aren't wrong, they're just sometimes new and different. And Qt has to have backwards compatibility and forwards compatibility. Qt Wayland has an API that is fixed and abstracted, and we have to support apps written 10 years ago. We have Qt 6 API frozen, so we're frozen for six years in, in, into the future. And Qt Wayland is stuck in the middle trying to bridge these somewhat times different concepts. So it's in a difficult situation. But despite that, it's quite good. The code is really well written. Your unit tests are excellent. Another challenge with Qt Wayland and an opportunity is Qt Wayland is, is Wayland itself lets you cherry pick what you want to support. If I'm making a coffee machine, I don't necessarily need drag and drop. So your compositor just wouldn't implement it. And we see this quite a bit. Qt Wayland has effectively two distinct sets of user groups with the desktop side and the embedded side. And inside Qt Wayland, we're seeing divergent code paths because you can completely replace one of the core protocols of how you turn some window content into what the window manager considers a window. So if you're only showing a full screen window, you don't need the concepts of resizing and all of these. So you go through a completely different code path with an API that matches what you need. But the problem there is Qt Wayland then has these divergent paths. KDE has been very active on Qt Wayland. We've made well over 50 commits, and I think your Qt Wayland people do a very good job of now asking us for our opinion on any patches that would affect us. Two developers have gained approval status because of the work we've been doing in Qt Wayland. That's myself and Alish. So if you do work in Qt Wayland, you are going to be met with friendly faces, or my face, when, when you make that patch. And to some extent, we're seeing a slight change in the Qt company's um, core demographic of not being so much on the desktop side, but being slightly embedded focused. At which point, if we're the only people using the developer side, the desktop side, it's our responsibility to make it work. You can't expect somebody who doesn't gain anything from to, to do the work. We're the people who gain from a lot of these desktop features. It's our responsibility. And I do want to say the Qt maintainers, both Jonas, Esco, and Paul, have been absolutely amazing at welcoming people. So what are your next steps in Qt Wayland? Well, we want to explore a couple of more API for your Wayland specifics, going really low level and exporting everything that you can do in Wayland to, to a client. And getting things into Qt Wayland is a very good way of avoiding some of the issues that you might see with dependencies. If we do things on the KDE side, um, we might, might hit some challenges. Uh, so I mentioned earlier about layer shell. We might want to, well, we do want to expose all of that inside Qt. Uh, it's window activation that we've done and have currently exposed as KDE API. We want to just add that Qt string overload somewhere into Qt, even Qt Wayland itself, or maybe into Qt Core so we can use it. And anything that we can't abstract into Qt Window, ideally we want to try and expose as much as possible in Qt Wayland API. There is a boff this week. It is on Tuesday. I can tell you the time in my time zone. It's one o'clock. But other people adjust accordingly. Please do attend. There are multiple ways to extend Qt Wayland. If Qt Wayland doesn't have everything you need, so Qt Wayland will do everything like showing a window, but if you want to introduce some custom Wayland protocol, we have some slightly fragmented landscape in KDE. So there's a library called KWayland, which is a very low level API exposing a one to one mapping of Wayland protocols. In general, we found this isn't necessarily a direction we want because, from a client API point of view, it sucks to use a one to one mapping of what gets sent over your wire. On Wayland, if you want to send a large struct, 
we don't send a large truck because of the message uh, as a maximum message size. So instead, we send it as a stream where we send each thing individually and then as a semaphore. And you don't need to know from a client point of view about all of those details. So I think we're finding we want to provide much higher level API and in the right place. But it's also worth mentioning Qt provides a uh, mechanism to extend with a custom Wayland protocols. Uh, it's a classical Qt Wayland client extension. And we're kind of in a transitional phase of where, what we're using inside KDE. You can use, you can use a mix and match. Uh, so to use Qt Wayland client extension, it's very much like using QD bus XML to CPP. It creates a class, it's got virtuals for messages that come to us, and it has methods for things that we send to Compositor. And because everyone just likes to copy existing code, copy a code inside KGUE add on source recorder, and then just adjust accordingly. It should be fairly intuitive. But what about missing functionality? For example, if you've got an application with toolbars and toolbars something behave a different, bit differently, how would we expose? And we find the Wayland spec protocol doesn't have what we want. But it's important to know the Wayland specs are still evolving. There's, we are still getting changes in. The activation that we talked about only landed in the last two months. And we helped push for that on the KDE side, especially Alice Paul did a lot of the work. So everything is still evolving. And one of the things that I think has been a problem with Wayland till now is that all the specifications are being decided upon by composite developers. It's a big group of people, all from different teams, but everyone is a composite developer. And I think this is the root of a lot of the problems. If this comes with an inherent bias, that people answering the questions, what is going to be best from the point of view of a compositor? And we do need a healthy balance. So I think we do need application developers to be coming in saying, well, these are my requirements. requirements. This is what I need. Please make something that works. So a solution to this is to get involved. Make sure all problems are known and elevated throughout the stack. If you're missing something in Qt, elevate it to Qt. If Qt is missing something in the Wayland protocols, elevate it to Wayland protocols. All the people are very friendly and will listen, as long as they're aware. And a common theme that we've found when we've been doing all of our work is it's better to start ages ago. As with all of these things, we thought, oh, I wish I'd done that five years ago so I could be using that now. Whether it's a Qt change that we're now blocked in on Qt 6, or Wayland protocols, which is a very slow moving process, for good reason, but it's a slow moving process. So it's important to just start now. So to wrap this up, test, test, test again. As developers, you should be using Wayland on your application for as much as possible. Even if you don't try and insist that your users use it because of issues, as developers, you really should. And we're here to help. If you have a specific issue, we are happy to help. Please do ping us. If you're on Bugzilla, use the Wayland keyword, and it will get noticed by people who search for that keyword, which I do. Uh, don't just move things to Quinn, but add this Wayland keyword so we can keep track of everything. And if need be, elevate issues to Qt. And I think that's the end of my talk. Well, I know that's the end of my talk. I wrote it, and it says the end. Thank you, Dave. Uh, there is a first one question. Does the layer shell work on X11 or does it need to be if deft? It would not work. It would be possible to write a library that semantically does it in process and have a client only speak in semantic terms which then get mapped to X11. The layer shell library as is, I don't know if it crashes if you try and use it, but it certainly would do, wouldn't be very useful. Okay. Uh, I'll put in a question. Since you mentioned that Wayland protocols are moving target, uh, how much effort do you estimate has been, let's say, wasted because of those changes? 
too much, but a lot is necessary. I think everyone's quite hesitant on committing to API, particularly as Wayland doesn't have a very good mechanism of doing binary incompatible changes. It's got a very good uh, mechanism for adding API, like a, a binary compatible change, but it doesn't have a very good one for incompatible ones. So people are naturally cautious, like you would be for a public API in the library. But that means people tend to put things in certain with certain names and just renaming a protocol with no actual code changes is quite difficult because you need to support anyone in the old uh, name and anyone using a new name, even if it's the exact same thing across the wire, because because this uh, text description of the interface name is sent at some point, and the code generators just don't handle that very well. So, okay. thank you. Too uh, much, but it's necessary. Thanks. Uh, there are no more questions as far as I can see, but a lot of applause in the chat. So. I don't need to say give a <laughs> give a <laughs> give a hand to David. Uh, thank you for the talk, and see you later. Bye bye.